today on Hitch 20. Brain key, brain key, brain key. Hitchcock's rare attempt at science fiction. The case of Mr. Pelham. You're mad, you know. Much has been said about the 52 feature films that Hitchcock directed, but nobody talks about the 20 television episodes he also directed. The Hitch 20. I have the feeling that he's trying to to move into my life, to crowd closer and closer to me, so that one day he is where I was, standing in my shoes, my clothes, my life, and I am gone. A common favorite situation for Alfred Hitchcock was forcing an everyday person to question their sense of reality. In the case of Mr. Pelham, a man is replaced by an alien double. We go along for the ride, unsure of whether it's really happening or if the man is hallucinating. This is an episode about identity issues, and Hitchcock's done identity issues in many of his films. North by Northwest, uh, is he Roger Thornhill or is he George Kaplan? These are things that are part of sort of the, the Hitchcock toolkit that he brings out in this episode. It was a bold choice casting a comic actor in a serious situation. It has a way of amplifying the anxiety. Tom Ewell was already a well-known actor, a Tony Award winner on the stage. He had just been seen in the hit comedy The Seven Year Itch alongside Marilyn Monroe. What are the tools that an actor uses to create that sympathy, to create that connection between us, the audience, and the actor on screen? And I think that the answer to this is his amount of worrying he does. He does a lot of worrying, and he vocalizes a lot. He's always like, oh, you know, should I call the police? I don't know. Uh, there's this guy following me around. You know, I'm gonna... He even goes to the movies to take his mind off of things. He's, he's constantly worried. And we as an audience, because we don't understand what's going on ourselves, we can identify with that worry. This duality between comic energy and tension was common for Hitchcock. He said that his goal was to amuse the public and not to depress them. People flock to the pictures for relaxation and pleasure. They don't want to emerge all bowed down with sadness. You'll notice that when Pelham reacts to events, his face is almost in pantomime. This exaggeration lightens the fear of the situation and allows the audience to have fun. At the same time, this comic energy helps us develop empathy for a rather mundane character. Now, when we meet the other Mr. Pelham, Mr. Pelham number two, he's completely unworried. He doesn't seem to care at all. He seems to be, he's like waiting. He says to the original Mr. Pelham, oh, I was wondering when you would show up. He's got everything under control. He's completely cool. And, and, and in that sense, he's completely unsympathetic. By the time we get to the end of the film, we don't even notice the split screen optical effect. We're so in belief of these two as separate identities. Hitchcock does this by subtly coaxing us into forming allegiances with certain characters. For example, take a look at this introduction to Dr. Harley. As they both walk toward the table, notice that the doctor looks directly at us, as if we are also in the room. Somehow this plants the seed of trust with the audience. A psychiatrist is an interesting character. He has absolutely zero effect on the plot. You could take that character out and the plot would have happened exactly as it would if he was in it. His job is to get us, the viewer, up to speed on what's going on. The psychologist also serves as a sort of reality barometer for the audience to gauge whether Pelham is hallucinating. He's our way of detecting what's real and fiction. It seems pretty clear this double is a real person. When looking at the locations used in Pelham, you'll notice that he's never shown outdoors. These indoor settings create a subtle sense of confinement, that he's trapped with these predictable habits. If you notice, um, in all the backgrounds, there are pairs of things. The lights on the wall are in pairs. 
The chairs are in pairs. There's two water goblets on the table. The paintings are pairs. You'll see in his office as he walks in, two secretaries typing on two typewriters, two file cabinets, two paintings on the wall. It's important in a psychological film like this to provide physical evidence for the audience to track to help determine what's real and imagined. Earlier in the show, uh, we've seen uh, Pelham tell Dr. Harley that he's changed the locks in his flat and there's only one key. When he goes into his flat and we find out from his servant that the fake Pelham had been in there, how do we show that he's thinking there's only one key? How they do this is we have a close-up of Pelham pulling the key out of his pocket and touching it. And then we go back to Pelham's face. That is brain key, brain key, brain key. We're showing thought process on screen through a shot. Hitchcock used this focus on objects to build anxiety each time Pelham tries to fight back. He changes the lock on the door. That doesn't work. He changes his signature. That doesn't work either. Later, Pelham comes in and looks at the check that has the middle initial in it. He doesn't have to say anything. The audience automatically thinks, oh my God, the middle initial. The double knows about the middle initial thing. Then he changes his tie with the assumption that this will throw off his double's attempts to copy him. Unwittingly, of course, this change of tie just proves to everyone else that he is no longer Pelham. He makes the one mistake of buying a different tie, and that's, oddly enough, the one thing that makes him look like the guilty party, if you will. I've known for several days that there's an agency more than human here. The beauty of science fiction is that the cause of events don't necessarily need an explanation. By trivializing the cause, it forces us to examine the character's reaction. Why? No reason. It just did, you see. The case of Mr. Pelham manipulates our feelings and perceptions using character allegiances and physical objects to build that classic Hitchcockian anxiety. In our next episode, we uncover the structure of suspense.